Hey everyone, in this video we're going to do another short culture lesson specifically on Roman names. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore how ancient Roman names work and compare them to how our names work today. So the first thing I want you to do is just, I ask my students this all the time, just take a minute and think of your own name. Does it have any significance? Um, where did it come from? Why did your parents name you that? Are you named for a relative, a religious figure? I want you to think about how important your name is to your daily life. And all these questions are important because they help us understand not only our own names, but ancient Roman ones too. So if you can understand how our name plays a role right in your daily life in our culture, that's the lens I think you should use when you look at ancient Roman names, okay? So let's start by thinking about modern names, okay? So as an American, I'll speak for myself, and I'll say that I have three names, right? Which is a fairly um, common thing to have. So you, I have a first, a middle, and a last, right? This is a, a very typical structure. So here's an example of another sort of famous name, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, right? JFK. So in this scenario, the first name, John, is his given name, right? And identifies who he is. Fitzgerald was his mother's maiden name, right? So his middle name is his mother's maiden name. This is actually another um, common structure. But the middle name can often be chosen for a variety of reasons, right? It might have religious significance or whatever it might be. In this case, it just happened to be um, sort of an honor of his mother. And finally, you have uh, Kennedy, right, which is the family name. OK, so your last name or family name tends to identify who your people and your relatives are, right? Who your um, close family are. That's the sort of typical, um, typical modern name. OK, so let's take that and look at a traditional Roman naming system. And we're going to look specifically at Roman men. OK, and this system is often called the trianomina, right? The three name system. So here we see one of the most famous uh, Romans that ever existed, Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. And I'll say off the bat, I know there's four names there. I'll explain all of them. OK, so you might know him right as the famous Roman general who fought against Hannibal in the Second Punic War. He comes from a very, very famous family. OK. So like us today, the Romans also had this three name system, right? So there is a connection there. And it seems to have developed pretty early on among the, the peoples of early um, Italy, right? The early Italian peninsula, you start to see this in different places, okay? It's hard to track down exactly where it started, of course, but you do see it's not just the Romans doing this. So let's unpack each of these three names and understand their meaning. And we'll try to see if there's a, a particular structure to each name, which there is. And we'll unpack what that structure is, what the significance is, and hopefully we'll understand where Roman names come from. OK, so the first you want to look at is called the prinomen. OK, so the first name for a Roman man would be his prinomen. So this is the given name for a Roman man. It, this name could be different um, among family members, right, particularly brothers to help identify each of them. So often when you see um, you know, brothers in a family, they'll have a different prinomen. That way you know who's who. But at the same time, there's a ton of overlap. Um, in Roman uh, prinomia, right? And it leads to this really um, sort of confusing often uh, system where, um, you know, Romans have the exact same first name, right? And it just gets a little confusing. Interestingly enough, there seem to be some common prinomia that are repeated among the Roman people. So of the ones that we have today, right, there seems to be about 30 or 40 common ones, okay, that you just see over and over and over again. And these are ones you probably um, would recognize, particularly if you're a Latin student or just someone who enjoys Roman culture, right, Roman history, names like Marcus, Gaius, Gnaeus, um, Lucius, right, Lucius, Publius, Quintus, Titus. These are names you just see repeated over and over and over again. So from what we have recorded, there doesn't seem to be as much variety as you might think, but you also have to take that with a grain of salt. A lot of the names we have are from sort of upper class Romans, right? The ones who get uh, their names recorded. So it's hard to tell exactly what's going on here, um, but there is a lot of repetition, which just makes it interesting. Okay. So often the firstborn son would have the same prinomen as his father. That's a, a pretty um, common convention you see. So you would have the same name as your father. And it's a great way to honor your father, right? We do this today um, by having, you know, junior, right? Or the third. So there is a thing even today of naming, um, you know, sons or children. Um, I feel like it's more, more for sons after their father. Same thing. OK, the other interesting thing about the prinomen is this name wouldn't be given right away, but it would uh, rather it would be given about a week after the baby was born as part of a ceremony. Right. And this is kind of an interesting thing you can look up um, that whole idea of the ceremonial giving of a name. Um, but there is more to it. But again, the first name is called the prinomen. And again, it's just your, your given name. 
Now, the second name is called the nomen, which is the word um, that we get the name name from, right? The word that, uh, where we get name. So the word nomen actually comes from the word to know, which makes a lot of sense because the nomen is what you know someone as, right? So there is an interesting connection there if you really want to dive into the, uh, um, the language, okay? So the nomen was the name of a man's gens, right? Or his larger family group. So this is where it gets a little tricky. It's sort of like a family name, but you want to think big picture. Okay, so in this case, when you have Publius Cornelius, the Gens Cornelia, right, this Cornelius Gens um, is famous, right? So he's part of the famous Gens Cornelia. And there would have been a ton of different members um, who were only distantly related to each other. So um, they all are, have that, that nomen of Cornelius, right? But they're not necessarily, um, you know, all so closely connected. OK, the nomen is an easy way to identify Roman families. OK, some of them, like the Gens Cornelia or the Gens Caecilia, had many famous um, and very distinguished Romans. So because of this, it would be a point of honor for a Roman man to be connected to his family, right, especially if they're famous. So that nomen is really important. This is a way of saying, look who I am related to. Right. So there is an interesting connection there. Now, the third name is called the cognomen, uh, literally um, the, the name that goes with the nomen, right, cognomen. So the cognomen originally we think was a nickname, okay? Um, and the cognomen became, uh, over time, it evolved from the nickname, right, which sometimes you still see, to being the smaller branch within the larger gens. So in other words, if you're looking at this name, right, Scipio is the specific branch on the gens Cornelia, right? So in other words, of all the Corneliuses, the, the gens Cornelia, Publius Cornelius Scipio is part of the specific um uh, Scipio branch, okay? And we think this is uh, developed over time because it would make it easier to identify and distinguish between the larger family groups. When you have a lot of people in your gens, right, like the name Cornelius here, how do you know who's who? So that cognomen kind of takes on the role of being how you can tell and distinguish by making a smaller um, sort of family group there. OK, but since many of these um, cognomina started as nicknames, some of them still carry that that meaning. Right. They're, often you see um, nicknames as the third name. Right. So one of the famous ones is Skyvola, meaning lefty. Right. Um, another could be Rufus. Right. Redhead. So there's different sort of nicknames that still survive in, in the cognomen, which is interesting. So what I always teach my students, I think it helps them kind of understand this, is one way to think about it might be looking at your cousins. OK, so your cousins might have a different last name. Right. They probably do, but you're still connected to each other in this bigger family, um, bigger family tree. So that's kind of what the cognomen evolves into, sort of a different branch or a specific branch of a larger family tree. So again, in this example, you would know that Publius is part of the Scipio branch of the Cornelius or the, the Gens Cornelia, right? The Cornelius family. Okay. So it kind of, uh, it, it distinguishes in that. Okay. Now I did say that this was the tria nomina system, the three name system, but you do often see a fourth name, right? Depending on who you're looking at and if they're, if they're famous is kind of the idea. Okay. This fourth name is called the agnomen. Okay. So the agnomen was the fourth part of a Roman man's name and not all Romans had one. Okay. And this functions as the nickname, like the cognomen had originally done. So again, these, the, the meaning kind of shifts over time, but the agnomen becomes that nickname. So sometimes these nicknames could be honorary titles, right? That get given to Roman generals. In this case, Africanus was the nickname or the honorific title that's given to Publius Cornelius Scipio. And the reason why is he's the famous conqueror of Africa, right? in the Second Punic War, so they call him Africanus. Now, this is a really honorary um, uh, name or title, like I said, so everyone would know who he is and kind of what he accomplished, okay? Another example would be Lucius Aemilius Paulus, right? This man had the nickname Macedonicus, right? Um, because he conquered Macedon in the, the Third Macedonian War. So a lot of times you see that uh, for, for generals, the fourth name, right, the agnomen, is this honorific title of what you did. OK, some agnomina still retain their nickname quality. Right. So you see nicknames such as uh, Pius, Superbus, Polke, right, handsome, pretty, arrogant, right, pious, all these different nicknames. Those show up as agnomen or agnomina uh, as well.
Okay. A few famous men uh, who are known by their nicknames were people like the Roman general Germanicus, right? Um, who was the famous general who fought in, in Germany, right? In Germania. He has that nickname and he's known as Germanicus even today. Um, and his son is Emperor Caligula, right? Which means little boots, right? So his son um, with that nickname, that's what we know him as, the Emperor Caligula. So sometimes it sticks, okay? So all this is to say for Roman men, there's a lot of significance and there is sort of a formula of what your name is and what each piece represents represents. So it's not as random as you might think. There is a very ordered structure to it, which makes it kind of cool. And again, you can compare this to our names today, right? Um, you know, your first name tells a lot about you, but a lot of people debate what's more important, your first or your last name, you or your family. People's middle names are very interesting. Sometimes it's random. Sometimes it's a family member, a religious figure. Sometimes like with uh, JFK, like we said, you get named um, for your mother's maiden name, which is kind of interesting. So again, names tell us a lot about um, culture, okay, particularly for Roman men. But what about Roman women, right? Men aren't the only people in Rome, right? So how did Roman girls or women get their names, right? How does this process work? So if you take a look at Roman uh, women's names and their male equivalents, you can notice a pattern here. So on the left, I have um, female names like Cornelia, Julia, Caecilia, and Aurelia. And on the right, I have the male equivalents, Cornelius, Julius, Caecilius, and Aurelius. You should probably notice something here. The Roman girls' names are just the feminized version of their father's name, which is what we're going to talk about. So in other words, Roman women and Roman men have very similar names, just masculine and feminine. But specifically, Roman girls get the, the feminized version of their father's nomen, that family uh, name, right? The bigger family tree. So for an example, the daughter of Gaius Julius Caesar was named Julia, Julia, right? Because he is Gaius Julius Caesar. So his daughter, you take Julius, his, his gen's name, his, his nomen, and you turn it into Julia, and that's his daughter. Okay, so the question I want to ask is, why would you do this? And it's to preserve the family name, the nomen. And the reason you do this is a daughter, a Roman daughter, would be marrying into another family. So how are you going to preserve your family when your daughter marries someone else? Okay, this is how the Romans did it. They just gave the daughter the father's family name, right? And that's how you can preserve it. We see uh, something similar today, right? There is a tradition of women keeping their family names, or maybe even using them for the middle name of their children, like we said with JFK, Fitzgerald, that's sort of a common thing. Um, uh, you know, I can tell you teaching middle school and high school, I've seen a lot of students roll through my classroom whose middle names are very distinct and unique. And when I ask them, they tell me, yeah, that's my mother's maiden name, right? So it's sort of a very similar thing that we do today. By the late Republic, though, some Roman women um, even included their father's cognomen in their name, right? Because the cognomen became more and more important. So an example of that would be Cornelia Sulla, who's the daughter of the famous general Lucius Cornelius Sulla, right? She, that, that Sulla um, tracked with her as a way of pre preserving even more of the father's name. So again, there is this idea of uh, you know, women marrying men and changing families. You want to keep the family name. You don't want to lose it. That's what's happening here. And again, this is something a lot of people deal with today, right? If, if you get married, do you take your spouse's name? Do you hyphenate the name? Do you keep your own name? There's a lot of interesting things that we do. Okay. But what happened if you have more than one daughter, right? How does this work? Well, to carry on the family name, they would technically both be named after their father's nomad. Okay. So if you are, uh, you know, both have a father whose uh, nomen was um, Cornelius, you would have Cornelia and Cornelia. So how are you going to tell them apart? Well, you need a nickname, okay? So when you have two daughters, um, you can see that the, the nickname is Maior, which means older, and Minor, which means younger, right? So it's not the most creative thing in the world, but you just say, well, this is the older Cornelia, and here comes Cornelia Minor, the younger Cornelia. But that's a way you could tell them apart, right? And again, the same would apply if you had um, three daughters or, or more, right? So when you get three or more, it gets kind of interesting. Um, you, It seems that what they would do is just give them nicknames based on numbers, which seems a little mean. But you would have uh, nicknames like Prima, Secunda, and Tertia, meaning first, second, and third. Um, and, and it does sound kind of mean to be like, hey, three, get over here, right? But that's the idea, right? You're just naming and giving them a nickname so people know who you're talking about because your daughter would have the, the, the same name, all your daughters, okay? So by the time of the Roman Empire um, and later on, we start to see these uh, naming practices becoming a lot looser and you start to see a wider variety of women's names. So for instance, you have Claudia Livia, right? The sister of the emperor, of the emperor Claudius, um, who's named after her grandmother, Livia, who is the wife of Augustus, okay? So that's sort of a, a different 
Tate. They're not naming it after the father. They went for Lydia, um, the famous empress of Rome, right? And because of this, she's often nicknamed as Lavilla, meaning little Livia, right? So you start to see looser names in, tor in, in terms of Roman women uh, as we go forward. But again, the idea is how do you preserve names? What do the names mean? And, and it's really interesting when you dive into the Roman naming practice, because it'll tell you a lot about the culture and how they think and what's important to them, the same way that we can see that today. Okay. So if you want to learn more about this, I would highly recommend that you keep learning. This is just a basic overview, um, something I like to do with my students just to get them thinking. There's a lot of good resources out there where you could really dive into this um, and see exactly how the names work and the whole process and different intricacies, uh, intricacies of it, rather. This is just to more give you, like I said, a general overview, sort of that 10,000 foot um, bird's eye view, just so you get a sense of it. Because if you are a Latin student, you're probably running into um, names in a textbook, right? Particularly if you're using a textbook with like a, a, the reading method with stories, you might see Cornelia running around or Flavia, right? Ecce Romani has those, um, you know, depending on what you're looking at. So it's important to know how the names work. And if you do become a fan of Roman history and you want to dive into famous Romans, that's where it becomes really interesting. And you can tell a lot um, based on people's names, okay? So I'd always encourage you to keep after it, um, keep learning, dive into it wherever you can find good information. Um, and just keep learning about it if you're interested. If you have any questions, Questions at all, feel free to put them in the comments below. I'm always uh, happy to help you out, but otherwise, have some fun with it. Good luck.